you very much. Um, here I put some questions uh, that I would like to address. Uh, it is for this supernova. Here I have excellent speakers before me, so I think I believe for a lot of this task. And my exascale, uh, then I would like to talk about some supernova codes and compare the methods that were used uh, in the from 60s to 80s, which I call Nika methods, to today's methods, uh, Terra methods, and uh, perhaps future methods that I uh, could brainstorm that I could develop uh, to. And finally, a comment on the right side of the supernova codes. Now, some messages I think I could just inform supernova codes have already been under resolved, I think. Uh, HPC high-performance computing must be backward compatible for G modules because we have seen that some modules live forever. And then I would like to talk about adaptive variables, which I think are something that would very much help uh, to deal with uh, meta or exascale uh, computer systems. Now, what is a supernova? I try to uh, put in the stuff that has not yet been shown. A uh, complex supernova uh, happened from the massive stars from the uh, era of the 80s so of us to about uh, 20 or somewhat more uh, solar uh, mass sequence stars. And it is just a linear core uh, compressing about 10,000 kilometer radius that collapses in a uh, uh, collapse. The nuclear star uh, is a lot of emitting neutrinos, as uh, my previous speakers have shown. Yes. Is it better now? Um, the main question oh, I see there is a, a direction problem. I should not look at my talks, then you hear me better. <laughs> and I can spend it. So, um, I like to. to <laughs> okay. Um, now, there are two explanations, uh, possible explanations for Gogol supernovae. Uh, just if you follow the energy through the model, we would have gravitational binding energy that during the collapse is. Uh, um, transferred into internal heat, and neutrinos are produced. And then uh, these neutrinos are emitted from the uh, proto-neutron stars, my previous speakers have shown. They cause a lot of fluid instabilities around the proto-neutron star and heat the outer layers, which uh, should lead to the shock revival. An alternative model is that the gravitational binding energy is put into rotational energy by angular momentum conservation. This, uh, together with fluid instabilities, uh, causes the magnetic fields to grow, and this magnetic pressure addition could also help to uh, eject the outer shock. Now, in this model, it is clear that neutrino transport is essential, but it is also essential here, if, even if it does not appear so, because if you would leave the neutrinos out of the system, your model would explode right away, and you wouldn't even be able to uh, study the magnetic effects. Now, to get to the scale of the problem in, into your mind, this is a plot of the density scale in logarithmic scale, and here we have an radius on both sides. You saw here the collapse, and you can see the neutron star, you reach really above nuclear density, but in a very, very small uh, part of the computational domain. Then the density at the surface of the neutron star is uh, dropping very, very uh, rapidly, going through the part of decoupling of the neutrinos. And then at a much, much lower density, around 10 to the 9 grams per cubic centimeter, you have this uh, fluid instable uh, heating region where the neutrinos that stem from the dense part will heat around here. I show this to make you aware of this huge dynamic density contrast in the problem that is responsible for this uh, huge differences of microscopic physics that happens around here or here or out here, or even uh, in the outer 
so it's a petrol quality uh, simulated correctly in the model. I think I can go fast over the uh, importance of the supernova models. You know, we can see the light curve over the electromagnetic spectrum. We can conclude about the energy and the asymmetry of explosions. We can identify the ejector composition and velocity is closed by even in separate direction. Uh, the Newton stars that are left from the collapse have important properties like spin and kick with respect to the ejector. And we could once see the neutrinos directly, and another neutrino signature of that type would be really, really helpful to identify the supernova uh, mechanism. Potentially, we could identify the radiation waves. Now, just let us now look at the space representation of such a, uh, of a model of a uh, core collapse supernova. This is taken from one of our 3D simulations. Uh, Tony would call it also a uh, used interaction uh, model. The neutrino transport has a lot of approximations that I will discuss later in my talk. Um, what you can see here is on the left side uh, the entropy in color. So between the hot layers here that are convective on the neutron star, there is the shock from standing around here that separates from the just being falling cold matter from the outside. The uh, little white dots, these are mass traces, so that you can imagine how the matter is, is moving. Then at the center of the problem, you have the neutron star. The black lines show density levels, so 10 to the 12 grams per cubic centimeter levels around here. This would be about the surface of the Newton star. And now you, you have to put the picture I showed before into this diagram. So here we have this by orders of magnitude higher density than around here in this 10 to the 9 grams per cubic centimeter attracting matter. On the right hand side, I show in color the magnetic field. You can now see the trapped magnetic field light in this turbulent uh, matter leads to very, very fine grained uh, structure and enhancing of, of magnetic field strength, uh, which is very interesting and which should be uh, investigated much further. And what I also would like to show with this, here we are still orders of magnitude above the resolution scale for the magnetic field that we should actually achieve to uh, um, assess uh, these uh, processes here uh, in Haven. Now, why is it an exascale problem? We have a lot of difficult physics coordinates, as uh, it was discussed already. We have a local reaction network between the neutrinos and the, um, hydro the, the, the matter treated by hydrodynamics, like electrons, uh, nuclei, and so on. We have little hydrodynamics, uh, which is not, not on a local scale, but semi local. And then we have uh, non local processes like gravity in the Newtonian approximation and in the uh, just the neutrino transport that poses the largest technical difficulty. And the only hope we can get from to, to go to a really large scale is that the computational load from the reaction network and the local reactions is very large. So the polarization takes, if we compare with hydrodynamics, we are in a better situation that even if we go to other small computational uh, boxes for the polarization, we still have a lot of local interactions to calculate in each part, and this alleviates some of the polarization issues. But still, a 3D supernova simulation should, I think, feature about thousands to the three souls. If we want to resolve the PV, the magnetic fields, it would really need much more. And in each zone, we need for neutrino types about 20 energy bins because we have to do it spectrally, as Tony pointed out. And we need perhaps about 100 propagation angles. And if you multiply these numbers, this will add out to about 64 terabytes just to store the data for some time and snapshot. Now, the problem 
is that this data should not only be stored, it must evolve. But the neutrinos transport now this information with light speed from zone to zone. And this is physics. This does not depend on any uh, numerical algorithms. This is just physical information, propagation. So if we are told to look for uh, communication using algorithms, this is a really common task because we cannot reduce the physics that takes place in, in these models. Then there is all this some hope that we know they interact by weak interactions and this uh, intensive neutrino interaction, it reaches from uh, the surface of the neutron star around 10 kilometers and they could uh, completely decouple around 1,000 kilometers. And if you calculate this uh, with respect to the 10,000 kilometers in the computational domain, you see this is a domain of the computational domain. So one could think about smart methods to uh, focus this heavy work really on, on this uh, lower percentage of the computational domain. Uh, now, you have to look at this equation again. It's really one of the nicest equations. Tony was pioneering this effort with the first uh, really working Boltzmann solver in the 90s. And if you look at this code, it's really nice how amazingly accurate this every piece in the code corresponds to the paper description. So one could perhaps call it the standard of open source software in the supernova business. And here, and shown is the neutrino distribution function that is at the heart of the problem. It's spherical symmetry, it has only three spatial uh, um, degrees of freedom, not the six from 3D. And the Boltzmann equation is mainly a time derivative, so an evolution of this distribution function that depends on the action. This is the mass zone, the neutrinos that flow into the mass zone and leave the mass zone and the uh, interaction part. An emissivity and an opacity. Uh, I will talk a lot about these two quantities, but what I mean in principle are all the other interactions as well that make a uh, complicated, uh, uh, more complicated exchange with the matter. Then one has to add propagation corrections uh, because in spherical coordinates the neutrinos do not propagate straight. In the coordinates you have to correct for the angle change if the neutrinos move through the star. And you also have to correct for observer corrections because in the moving description every observer seems the energy is a little different. This is the spherical symmetric case. In multi-dimension, uh, you have to do approximations. One of the common approximations is this ray by ray approximations where you intersect the model into angles and the neutrino can still propagate out in any angle that does not have to be radial. But you have to be aware that the neutrino emitted here will propagate through this angle. And if it leaves here, it will not enter this wedge. Uh, it will come back and enter the same wedge from here. So it will move like this through your ray, ray by ray angle. And the problem with this is that if you have an accretion flow, a downflow, that makes a hot spot on the neutron star that will radiate in all direction, if you go to ray by ray, it will only radiate itself, the matter that is coming from somewhere else. And you cannot achieve conversions with, with such models because the better you make the angular resolution, the more you restrict this heating region of your emitted neutrino to just above the neutrino, which will interfere with, with the actual flow that caused your hot spot. Either way, these simulations are a very important step forward, and one can now look at the evolution in RTD and uh, in context with the semantic models, one can now see that after a long while of bubbling up and down uh, of the hot matter on the neutron star, uh, uh, many groups see now uh, explosions to, to happen. I, I'm not yet quite happy with the comparison between the different uh, models, 
Ebenen der Energie und der Explosionsarten liegen, noch heißt in die Tiefen zusammenstehen, wenn wir mit dem Spektrum der Tiefen bloß. Now, I move to the blackboard design, which should indicate that now it is more and more brainstorming, sketchy thoughts about the algorithms. Let's go to the mega gigascale methods of the 80s. So hardware, we had a few CPUs, like a gray vector machine, we had shared memory. Uh, simulations, the attempt already was a strength of symmetry, global simulations, but the dimensions are much reduced. Then, with shared memory, one can solve everything at once, so the methods are implicit, and we have just an adaptive time step, in some cases adaptive mesh too. The modules emerged according to the physics know-how, so some people designed hydrodynamics uh, methods, some people designed uh, weak interactions, some people worked on the neutrino transport, this couples to the linear algebra tools or to the equation of state, and then these uh, tools were put together into a uh, uh, nice module separated code. Now, let's look at the Terra scale methods. Now we have many CPUs distributed in shared memory. The simulations still need to be global, but they require multi-dimensions. Now people started to parallelize hydrodynamics alone. Here uh, one simplified things by going to an explicit finitely differenced uh, codes, introducing adaptive mesh or smooth particle hydrodynamics, while the neutrino transport was much group specific. So each group had their own neutrino transport approximations that were not necessary. The interaction rates and the equation of state, because they are now more used by many souls, uh, are tabulated in almost all cases. The difficulty with this approach is now through the domain decomposition and the parallel IO, these modules merge all together. So the hydrodynamics is now not independent anymore from the neutrino or transport. So you get a huge parallel domain decomposed, everything uh, including uh, monster code, and just the equation of state is sitting nicely there and exchangeable by. You see the problems. Uh, I essentially force all bodies to one uh, domain decomposition. Now, this is very problematic, even for um, from the physics point of view. At high density, it is very small free path. You have now very fast weak interactions. So the neutrinos are uh, just a part of the same gas that electrons and nucleons are. So you cannot say the neutrinos are transported differently than electrons in this one gas. But in your code, you treat the neutrinos separately from the electrons and nucleons. Neutrinos are treated by some transport algorithm, electrons and neutron, nucleons in blue here by hydrodynamics. But they are coupled by the interactions. So if you use a little bit different discretization in these two parts, you have always uh, getting them out of equilibrium and being forced again into equilibrium by their interactions. Um, so this is one not nice thing by treating neutrinos and electrons and nucleons separately, even they are constituents of the same gas at nuclear density. Another problem at low density. At large mean free path, this is most of the computation domain, even if it's not the most interesting part of the domain. The uh, neutrino transport solver that handles the equilibrium at our density so that can manage to do this correctly. This will be a very cost intensive algorithm that might be an enormous overkill in this part of the domain. So we need some smart algorithms that can distinguish whether the algorithm is really needed here or not. So what I think what we could move to is to uh, have a larger scale, still have the multi-dimensional simulation, but now the modules become independent from the particle species, so we don't have a neutrino module and a hydro module, but we make 
and tracked political modules that has other than politicals and stamp neutrinos and make the ray tracing free stamping module that only has neutrinos because electrons are not free stamping, for example. So we have different approximations at hand and we couple all the physics ingredients into one approximation box that is then free to choose a different approach of parallelism as, for example, approximation approximation tool. However, we need then an approximation manager that automatically selects according to runtime conditions and different uh, domains which of these approximations will be used. And I think in this way I see a chance to handle, to, to break down such a monster code to, to a beta or exascale method. And if we span the whole code on all physics and plus so we are trying this approach with an isotropic diffusion source approximation where we then split the material distribution function into tracked particles so they don't move at all and streaming particles that freely move. And we have all if we have scattering particles then we mix them together as a the parallel stacked and plus some parallel streaming so that the flux corresponds to the physical flux. Then we set up two different equations. One evolution equation for the tracked particle uh, uh, part and one equation for the streaming uh, part. Now if we know that they are tracked, we can in the Boltzmann operator here simply go to the right of the dynamic unit and here we can go to the ray tracing unit. Mm -hmm. So this operator simply find by a lot in this split. And then we have to add one additional source function that can convert tracked particles into streaming parts and, and back. If we add these two equations up, we get the original or approximation to the original uh, now, the task of the uh, adaptive algorithm uh, uh, manager, or approximation manager, is to define this uh, transfer function uh, between the two approaches or approximations in diffusing reaction or streaming machines, depending on the local conditions. And there is actually a possibility to do this if you have the diffusion limit, you can assign the diffusion operator to go to the sigma function plus some corrections that I cannot discuss now. So if you do this and plug this in the two equations, you actually you really get the uh, diffusion equation here and the free steaming equation for the streaming particles. In the streaming limit, your coupling function is just the emissivity. Here you get the uh, uh, equation that makes the trapped particle go exponentially away and the streaming particles just stem from the emission absorptivity in direct uh, um, relation to the matter. When the reaction limits the sigma is set to zero, then the trapped particle are in heat and thermal equilibrium with matter and the streaming particles get an exponential decay. Now, uh, tested in the model, uh, here we have in blue the Boltzmann solution, here the amount of neutrinos, here the energy, the mean energy of the neutrinos, compared to the red curve, this approximation. And the red curve is now added up between the trapped particles in black here and the streaming particles in green. So you can see here we have almost trapped particles in the neutral star and almost all these streaming particles in the outer machine. And the advantage of such an algorithm is that you can say, okay, now after 200 kilometers radius, I don't have any trapped particles anymore, so I could uh, switch off this expensive uh, diffusion uh, algorithm and just continue with the streaming uh, neutrinos. Or inside one or two kilometers or ten kilometers, you can say, I only have tracked particles, so it's good to have the ray tracing. That's, I hope, safe computation time. Now, let's come to my last 
point, uh, the life cycle of the supernova models, in the ideal world, we would have high performance computing 1990 and every 10 years, just arbitrary time scales. And we would imagine that we adapt our code always just to the current computing architecture. And then if we do our supernova model in 1990, we have one month uh, run perhaps. So in 2000, we would have one hour for a supernova model. And today, we would have some seconds that would be able to be on the front half an hour per second. The real world looks differently. Already in 1999, in the codes, there were some older codes, perhaps interactions, equations of state. And then in 2000, uh, on, on some scientific questions, then on this one has to improve the further architecture, say the neutrino part. So this module gets new, but this module still stayed in the status from 1990. Then other modules are renewed, and this code is always working along with this. Never a uh, production code that we can say this is now a done code and this will now produce data for 20 years. Perhaps the stereosymmetric case was a little bit in this kind, but in the multi dimensional domain, I don't see this code. And if you look at the time scales, we had runs of one month in 2020, two months today, the rubber tape, three months. Because if any optimization people try to put in more physics to answer uh, science questions, and then the, the actual computation time is only spending larger instead of short. So the development of production in the supernova codes uh, in some example, uh, there is no production supernova code, uh, and optimization always triggers new input physics. And, uh, Interest in the old version stops very quickly, so it's difficult to optimize old versions because they cannot answer the current uh, um, science questions. But the modules of these old codes, they might live, live forever, and therefore I think it's very important that the computer systems always stay accurate compatible. So, uh, my conclusions, supernova models are always under-resolved, the historical goal separation between hydroparticle and transport parts turns parallel supernova code into monsters. So please don't cut the most lengthwise into neutrinos and particles. We try to cut into a tail in the body and in the head, and the tail only doing diffusion, the body only doing ray tracing or something like this. Uh, Exascale computing requires a lot of automation. Uh, we are trying to think about this, how approximations could be compared and used uh, uh, automatically. This would also be very helpful for the validation if you would have concurrent approximations running and you can also compare them in their own runtime and see whether they both would fit or none would fit and so on. And the progress, I think, is still determined by human resources and the traditional career structure, which we should always keep in mind if we decide to grow our projects, that this know-how has to be carried along and people can do sometimes more than just the code that has no expert benefit that knows how this code has to be used and interpreted. Okay, thank you very much.